We should record this for Rob. He's not that special. Yeah, Alice, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough, good enough. Okay, so we're... What we're, what we're getting into is the refractometer lab. That's really what the background information for this, making phase diagrams. In the Ramsey Young, Ramsey Young lab, where you boil something and you just measure its boiling point over pressure. See how the boiling point changed? So that's kind of what we're messing with. So this is for pure, pure substances. So I guess that means that that refractometer lab isn't quite right because we were mixing two things. So we're not talking about that yet. But the Ramsey Young lab would be perfect for this. The stabilities of phases. Okay. So what they're what they're trying to say in this in this plot is that well, what are the phases first? What is that? Emily? Solid, liquid, gas. Now there's another one though. What's another phase? Those are the common ones, but there's a supercritical fluid, right? And we're gonna talk about that. There's another phase of matter. There's the P. So I call it a P. L. A. Plasma, right? fourth state of matter, I guess, or fifth, right? Okay. So, because remember, we were talking about the molar Gibbs energy is chemical potential. So the state, the phase that has the lowest chemical potential at that particular temperature will, is, is what's going to exist. Okay. And we're going to see in these plots, if you, incorporate, if you incorporate pressure into this, you get a plot like the one down below, right? Incorporate pressure into this, and then you get these boundaries going on, right? These, these green lines. And it's still the, the phase that exists is the one with the lowest molar Gibbs energy, the phase <laughs> that exists, but you get these, these boundaries, and that's where equilibrium is occurring between those two states, right? Because you can have a solid at a, I mean, pick a, right here. If you're at this pressure and that temperature, the most, the most stable state is a solid. There's no equilibrium going on between solid and liquid or anything. It's a solid, right? <laughs> so, but if you want to say, hey, what is the boiling point or melting point, then you have to go over to a curve, right? Like uh, if you're at this temperature, right, if you go up right there, right, and that pressure, that's where you'd have an, would that be described as the melting point, freezing point? What would that be? This little, right here. What's kind of a trick question. Because what is the equilibrium between at those two? I picked a very oddball one. The equilibrium is between what two solid. states? Solid and a gas. Now only if you grew up where Rob grew up are you familiar with this. Search than S. Snow. Yeah, it's how the snow disappears without it getting below freezing. <coughs> Sub sublimation. So that's kind of an oddball one. Let's pick one that we're more used to, right? Like that one. Right? You pick this pressure. At this pressure, go straight across. Come down. You just read the what point at that pressure? <coughs> boiling. boiling point. Now, how can you tell it's the boiling point? It's, it's an equilibrium between a liquid and a vapor. So that, that's the boiling point. Right. If you, at that pressure, and would have read down at this temperature, that is the freezing. 
freezing, or they also call it mm, freezing point or melting point, same thing, right? Okay. Or we don't use this word enough. We probably should because freezing point, melting point, it sounds like two different things, but they're the same thing. Instead, very often they use, there's an F, fusion point. We, we hardly ever say that though, right? We always say freezing point or melting point. Okay. So I would know the different parts of a phase diagram, right? And just their basic general construction. And this is pretty much it. You're plotting pressure versus temperature. And at this region where the pressure is really high and the temperature is really low, you're going to have the solid, right? Where the temperature is really high, right? And the pressure is generally low, you're going to have the vapor. And then in between, you have the liquid. So, and then you have these lines in between that are the, where the two states are in equilibrium. That's where you read those boiling points, fusion points. Well, liquid, the liquid state is generally in the middle. The purpose of this thing is really, okay, at this pressure and this temperature, what will the state be? That's one thing you could do out of this type of phase diagram. Another thing you could answer is, okay, what will the boiling point be at this pressure? You have some uh, Coca-Cola, I don't think. Well, maybe there's cooking involved, right? I don't know. Coca-Cola, they're, they're making it. So you got to heat up this vessel to such a point. Well, if something's going to all of a sudden boil on you, it's going to generate a lot of pressure. So it's good to look up these phase diagrams. And this, you're getting into chemical engineering now. And just be able to have a good handle on what's going to happen at that pressure or at that temperature. If especially, a real danger is if you're going to lower the pressure. Because then it's so much easier to boil things, right? Because look at that. If you lower that pressure, I don't know, let's to put things in perspective, let's say, let's say this is one ATM, and that means that this guy, ah, I'm way too high. If that's one ATM, that means, and this is, that means that this is where it would boil, right? Right there, that maybe if it was water, 100 degrees Celsius. But if you drop that pressure, it's some chemical process, man. You're removing vapors. You're re removing the stuff that you want. Or maybe something's condensing on you in the, in the reaction vessel. You drop the pressure. Look what happens to the boiling point. It drops like a rock. Everything is like that. Okay, so that means it's going to be really easy to boil. That, that vessel could be hot. Okay, so phase diagrams will hopefully help prevent some explosions and that sort of thing, too. Okay. Good point. Triple point. All of these, so it looks like if you look at, we call this the boiling point curve. I'm going to get to your answer, but we call that the boiling point curve. So you can pick a pressure and get the boiling point. They also call it the, well, I'll get to that in a bit. But Adriana asked about the triple point. What good is it for? That will never change. You. You can go to Mars, right? You have to, everyone dies on Earth, so you got to go to Mars, right? Life has to start all over. Science, everything starts all over. And you bring Earth's books. You have all these nice temperature charts, enthalpy and all these things. Dang, it'd be nice to use them again, but you have to calibrate everything. All your little thermometers, everything. Well, heck, just measure the triple point. Now, what is the triple point? It's where all three phases meet, coexist, right, equilibrium, whatever, right? So how could you get the triple point of water? What would you actually have to do? What would you have to set up on the, in the beaker on the bench? What would you have to do? Throw some liquid water in there and throw some ice in there and just let it set and reach equilibrium. You'll see that you'll have the triple point. All three phases coexist. Now you have to somehow control the pressure too, but all three phases have coexist. Yeah. So 
and that only happens at a particular pressure and a particular temperature. Can't be any, it's not just melting and freezing. It's a little more, again, I kind of have to get the pressure right too. So, so I guess it's a little more involved than just dumping ice in, in water. But, okay. So at a particular pressure and temperature, all three of those will exist. So all those three lines intersect there. Um, vapor pressure. Now, I said that they call that the, this curve, they call it the boiling point curve. Well, they also call it the vapor pressure curve. Why? Juan, why would they call that the vapor pressure curve? Boundary doesn't exist between what and what. What and what have the exact same chem well what is vapor pressure? Why do things boil? I might have a video on this. Let's see. I thought I did. Yeah. Let's see if this works here. All they're they're doing here, they're just seeing what <coughs> boiling looks like in whether it's in gravity or in space. And what I thought was kind of interesting is if you go back, right? Do you see any difference here? What's that? See the yeah, there. The bubbles aren't going anywhere for, for microgravity. And what, I don't know if this gets the point across or not. What we're trying to say is, once this reaches the boiling point, and then everything, everything in the whole bulk liquid wants to turn into a vapor. Not just, you know, the bottom part or anything. It's everything. So in... And here, it kind of brings it out better, even though you have that one little heating element. That's, so that's really hotter than everything else. But everything is really turning into a, a vapor. And gravity on Earth, since there's gravity, you know, the, it's, it's heavier on the bottom. And it's, so it's kind of more orderly looking. The bubbles kind of rise and things. But here, in microgravity, it kind of brings the point better across that, hey, everything's going to turn into a vapor at once. But what, at what point does it boil? I mean, so what? I'm raising the temperature of, of this stuff, right? You go to the beginning. OK, it's definitely not at the boiling point. Well, as I'm heating it up, heating it up, heating it up, the little red lights are going. What's changing? Why is it all of a sudden, boom, everything wants to turn into a vapor? It's called boiling point, but what's going on at the What's going on in there? Why isn't it boiling? I guess what I'm saying is, why isn't it boiling right now? What's that? Well, there's always an equilibrium, really, between the liquid and the vapor. But it doesn't want to turn into a vapor. The trick is, is there's always an equilibrium between the liquid and the vapor, right? OK, so well, you have that vapor. Nice. Fine. If you had a sealed container of the stuff, right? And it's not boiling, but like Emily said, there's an equilibrium going on. How can I get there to be more, actually more, water in the vapor phase. Right. What, do you, what do you do to this thing? You heat it up. And then you get 
more molecules have more energy, so you'll have more in the vapor phase. But they're still at equilibrium. So the rate of condensing and the rate of evaporating is still the same, but you heat it up. Now, if you pick some, you're not boiling, you pick some temperature, right? And you actually measure the pressure inside there, right? You're heating it up. Does the amount of water matter? Because right, these guys got to be reaching equilibrium, then you measure the pressure. That's key. You heat it up, the pressure is going to increase, right? We let it equilibrate. Would the amount of water matter? No, because it's an equilibrium thing. So whether you have it half full, a third full, or just a drop of liquid in there, as long as there's some liquid in there, it's at equilibrium, the, the pressure is going to be the same. What is that pressure called? It's the vapor pressure. And there's nice tables of it, right? The vapor pressure of water is this at this temperature. So we look, and they're usually in millimeters of mercury, we look them all up. Okay, so you raise the temperature, the vapor pressure goes up. Okay, until what limit is reached? Well, atmospheric or just whatever that external pressure is, right? Because in San Antonio, we're not quite atmospheric. We're a little bit below it because we're kind of elevated. So whatever the external pressure is, once that vapor pressure is the same as the external pressure, whatever it is, you're boiling. There's no difference. There's no boundary, what Juan said, the technical jargon. There's no boundary between liquid and vapor because the vapor pressure is the same as external. There's nothing, there's no difference. Boom, everything, flash. Just like in space, that movie was a little bit better than the boiling liquid than the one on, on Earth. External pressure. Because the external pressure is what's really keeping that darn thing a liquid. It's bigger, right? It's bigger than the vapor pressure. That's what's making the darn thing a liquid, with that external pressure's bigger. So if you make that external pressure lower, well, dang, the vapor pressure will reach the external pressure a lot quicker. It's a lot lower. And that's what happens in that Ramsey Young apparatus. You really reduce the pressure over that acetone, and, and then you you heat it up, it doesn't take much heat at all, and all of a sudden the vapor pressure is the same as that really low external pressure, the thing boils. And then you added some pressure, just let some air into the system, added some pressure, then you had to heat it up more before it boiled. So all of that is really just going along here. That Ramsey Young lab, right? A measure of pressure, the boiling point. Measure pressure, the boiling point, right? Add some air, add some air. So you're just making, you're plotting out a little tiny portion of that vapor pressure curve. So they call it the vapor pressure curve because that's really what it is. If you pick this boiling point right here, what's the vapor pressure? Well, it's this because it's boiling. It's on the line. Liquid and vapor have to be at equilibrium, so that means you got to be boiling. Well, you only boil when the vapor pressure is the external pressure. So they call this the vapor pressure curve or the boiling point curve. And that's what you were making in the Ramsey Young lab. Okay. So we've kind of, what was sublimation again? Going from solid to gas or gas to solid. Right. We talked about vapor pressure, boiling, boiling temperature. How about normal boiling point? What's so normal about normal boiling point? Yeah, pretty close. They just want the, atmos the pressure to be one atmosphere. They want the pressure to be one atmosphere, and they call that the normal boiling point. Okay. There's all these boiling points. I guess the one at one atmosphere is a little more special. That's what we typically live under. Okay. I think we talked about critical temperature once, once before. Sandy, what was it? You raise the temperature so high, then 
things are moving so fast or is it things are moving so slow? Which one is it if you raise the temperature really, really high? Really, really fast, right? So fast, these molecules, now again, this is pure substances, what we're talking about. Pick water, I don't know, it doesn't matter anything. What can't exist? They're moving, they have so much energy. What state cannot exist? Liquid, right? Liquid. Isn't it weird how a solid could exist, though? Right? Maybe. I don't. They don't go that high. <laughs> That's a good question. Could a solid exist? If a liquid can't exist, could a solid exist? I don't think so. Right? I don't think so. But what good is it? You have this, well, it's a new state. What do they call it? Uh, super critical, starts with an F, fluid. They call it a super critical fluid. Once you're above that temperature, and it's a super critical fluid, they call it. So it's, it's something that's too dense to be a gas. But it's not dense enough to be a liquid, right? Solidly, we can be more dense, you're right. So it's something that's too dense to be called a gas, but not dense enough to be called a liquid. We call it a supercritical fluid. What good is it? Do we use it for anything? There's big businesses that make their money solely on supercritical fluid. And then we just purchased uh, HPLC, which stands for High, mad, high performance. I don't know why. I think it sells more money, right? Performance. What does it have to do with chemistry anyway? High performance liquid chromatography. Okay. That doesn't have the word supercritical fluid in it at all. But you make the same darn machine that can generate a supercritical fluid and use it for chromatography. Works great. You can do a lot of things on it that you can on an HPLC. Not too many people drink decaffeinated coffee, do they? I don't know. But if you're a coffee drinker, which pretty much most of the world is, coffee's got to be just, you know, it's, it's like a religious thing, right? You can't. If you want to sell decaffeinated coffee, and there's some advantages to it. A lot of people can't handle the caffeine. You can't mess up the flavor at all. And just think how complicated it is. I mean, you crush up these beans, you'd pour this hot water over it, and all this brown stuff. It's a real extract. I mean, you have a lot of stuff in there. And every single one of those little components helps create the flavor. You can't mess up any of that. Well, how do you get the caffeine molecule out of that big, ugly mess? Like dissolves like, caffeine's organic, this extract's organic. How do you get it out and you do not mess with the flavor? How? And I don't know who figured this out. I think there's just so much money in it that people try everything. Caffeine dissolves super, super, super well in the super critical fluid of what compound? For all the money in Alice's pocket. <laughs> we have a container. Oh, you don't have it used it yet. There's a container of it over there. CO2, carbon dioxide. You take carbon dioxide and you get it above its critical temperature. It's a supercritical fluid. <laughs> I don't know how, it just really, really dissolves well caffeine. So you get the caffeine out that way. And then you lower the thing, lower the temperature down. Carbon dioxide just disappears on you, right? You can probably recapture it, since it's a greenhouse <laughs> problem, right? They probably recapture it so they could reuse it. But the caffeine's out. You got the solid laying there at the bottom. Works great. So, and that is the only use that I can think of commercial use for supercritical fluid. There's got to be more. But that's the biggie, and that's what's always stuck in my, in my brain. We talked about triple point. Okay, how we could 
use it to calibrate things. Okay. In this diagram is the, let's clean it up a little bit. is the melting point increasing or decreasing with pressure? Is the melting point increasing or decreasing as you crank up the pressure? It is what? It's increasing, right? As you crank up the pressure, is the boiling point increasing or decreasing? Increasing. And you know that has to happen. You crank up the pressure, the vapor pressure has to be that much higher to boil. So they're both increasing. Okay. And we talked about where sublimation occurred on there. Okay. Here's some typical phase diagrams. This one is for CO2, isn't it? It doesn't say on there. I'm pretty sure it is. This one is for carbon dioxide. Where is dry ice? Anna, where is dry ice? This is supposed to be carbon dioxide's phase diagram. Where is dry ice? You've heard that term, right? They sell it at somewhere. If you're going to put a big X where dry ice is, where would you put it? So you're going to go to HEB, you're going to pull out this block of this stuff. Where are you at on the phase diagram? And there's a hint. You've got to be in the solid region, right? Now, another hint is you pull this, you're, well, we, you live in this. You pull it out. What pressure are you at? What pressure are you at? Probably a little, technically a little bit less than one atmosphere, but you probably can't even tell on this bloody plot, right? So you pretty much just go at one atmosphere. So if you're going to put an X on this thing, where would the dry ice be? All right. We're right in here somewhere, right? Now, if, if the stuff is you know releasing carbon dioxide gas and you have this equilibrium going on between the solid and carbon dioxide gas you can even be more specific because you can't probably can't stop it right you're right on that bloody line right? you'd put an X right there right so the temperature of that thing of that dry ice that one atmosphere is 194. Oh, that's not Celsius. That's Kelvin. So what is that? Have to subtract 273 from it, right? So that's about 80 degrees yeah. Celsius below zero. But uh, what is that Fahrenheit? I have no clue, All right? But it's cold, <laughs> All right? Does that make sense? And it's dry ice because it's the solid in equilibrium with the gas. Except, is it really in equilibrium? It keeps leaving, right? So you've got to put it in a sealed container, right? So the, the gas just keeps leaving on you. OK. Um, OK. How about this compound? Water. Okay. Now, I 
That might be a good place to call it, because water we've got a lot to talk about. It's about, wait another 10 seconds, it's 10.50 anyway. All right, so let's call it right here. So there is no homework. Isn't that nice? Too bad it's not a Friday. So we'll, we'll hold it here.